Hello and warm welcome to the 19th episode of Consulting Without Borders Perspectives. I'm Victoria Olskaya, your host and moderator for today's show. I'm also the president of Gabriel El Salim Foundation, uh, a nonprofit organization based in California and dedicated to celebrating uh, inspirational life and work of the late Gabriel El Salim, who was himself an international consultant and a global leader. Happy November 1st, everyone. Hope you're enjoying the beginning of the last months of this fall. Uh, please uh, put in the comments uh, where you are tuning in from. I am broadcasting today live from Florida. Uh, you can just uh, post you can just use your comment section, whichever social media you're using, to post comments and ask questions as we go on with the show. But for now, please just let us know where you are. Where you are. A uh, special shout out, of course, to all of you, our amazing viewers tuning in from around the world. Also, a huge shout out to those of you who will be uh, tuning in to the replay uh, of this episode. Welcome. Today we're live on Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Uh, you can engage with us by asking questions in the comment section of the social media platform that, you're, that you are tuning in from. And if you're enjoying what you're seeing, please don't forget to hit the like button. It means the world to us, and it will also help spread the word about this live stream a little bit further. Uh, before I bring on our special guest speaker today, I wanted to remind that those of you who are professional consultants that today is actually the official deadline for uh, submitting the applications to the Gabriel El Salim International Award for Excellence in Consulting. Uh, so if you have not yet submitted your application, you can still uh, uh, do so all of the information and how to apply and the online application form is on the foundation's website and here you can see it on the screen i also wanted to say that of course we try to advertise this award and uh it we've been running it since 2011 so a lot of consultants are, already know about it and we had quite a few winners and applications in all these years but if you have never heard about it but you're just hearing about it for the first time now and you still would like to apply i would like to extend and i'll be happy to extend uh the deadline for a few more days until until monday november 6 so it's five more extra days to apply so if you're interested please, please send us your application, uh, describe your project, and we'll be happy uh, to look at it. Uh, there will be a, a, an award international committee working on evaluating the submissions. And please uh, don't miss this incredible opportunity to be recognized, to celebrate excellence, and to perhaps add uh, a professional award to your collection, whether it's your first award or one of many. Thank you for those who are joining us. I see uh, Lisa joining us from Oregon. Welcome, Lisa. Danyar joining from Kyrgyzstan. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Ron uh, Finch joining us from Italy. Great to have you, Ron. Thank you. And then Anya uh, joining us from the Netherlands, from Utrecht. That's great. Um, there will be more people tuning in, I know, a little bit later as the show rolls on. Again, you can post your questions, your comments uh, in the comment section, and we'll be happy to, to discuss them, to answer your questions. Uh, today, uh, we will be continuing our conversation on impact consulting, which we, in fact, started a couple of months ago. Uh, we had a wonderful guest speaker, Dr. Don Rennick. Oh, hi, hi, Roslyn, joining us from Washington, D.C. Welcome. 
So uh, at that point, uh, Dr. Rennick introduced us to the concept of impact consulting, B Corps, and what it means uh, for the businesses and consultants uh, to work with the UN uh, sustainability, uh, sustainable development goals. Today, we would like to continue this conversation, uh, look at it from a different uh, angle, perhaps, and talk more about how businesses can transition to sustainable models and also the consultant's role in this process. And we will focus on coalitions and co-creation and how those can assist in creating impact and in adding value. So let's get these questions um, answered by our guest speaker, who is a co-author of the book on co-creation and collaboration, who himself is a consultant with an impressive uh, 25 years of uh, experience. He is the founder of Elemental, a mission-first strategy and innovation firm based in Amsterdam. And he is also the founder and mastermind behind the House of Denim Foundation, which has a mission to connect and inspire denim stakeholders uh, in order for them to conceive and initiate platforms, projects, and events to make denim dry, clean, and smart. Please give a warm uh, welcome to our guest today, James Weinhoff, who is joining us from the Netherlands. James, I think you might be muted. Yeah, I've, <clears throat> hi, Victoria. I've purposefully muted myself because uh, behind me there's a delegation of other entrepreneurs and leaders from Amsterdam all um, wrapping up a, a lunch meeting. So it's a little bit noisy for a few minutes. But, uh, but yeah, I'm here. I'm really excited to be part of this discussion. And uh, thanks for the lovely introduction. Totally fine. And we all understand that we're all busy. We have to move uh, around. And I'm very thankful to James for making this time, for carving out this hour out of his busy schedule. I know that you are not even in Amsterdam right, right now. Can you tell us where you are? <laughs> yeah, I'm in, I'm in The Hague, the capital city of government of the Netherlands. Uh, and I'm, funnily enough, I'm here with a, a trade delegation of um, uh, the Amsterdam uh, Partners Agency, which is a, a public-private uh, club of um, entrepreneurs, museum directors, people from government, people from NGOs, uh, people from education. And uh, twice a year, we meet up and go somewhere interesting to connect to each other and get inspiration from, um, from the outside world. And today, we're in the seat of government, meeting all kinds of interesting people. And so now, I just jumped out of lunch, uh, which is wrapping up behind me. Uh, but I'm really excited to, uh, to be part of this international discussion on, on where consulting should be going. So. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, thank you so much again. Uh, because I, I know it was there was a little bit of a conflict in the timing, and of course we have to work across the time zones. And of course, mm. Europe is already one hour behind. You moved back to away from the summer, the summertime or the daylight savings time, and here in the US we're yeah. still having that time so there's all these one hour here and there <laughs> it's always sometimes hard uh, to navigate uh but, but we're, we're here, here we're all, yeah, we're yeah here. we are on, on time and we have our wonderful uh, viewers joining us i just saw someone joining us from uh alan uh, texas it seems that it's a consulting organization emk business consulting thank you very much for for joining welcome so um as, as uh, I will already introduce you, you have a lot that you have done in the area of consulting, spe specifically uh, mission first strategy and innovation. And uh, well, I just want to say how we met and just want to, to go back a, a few years ago. We actually uh, had the pleasure of uh, me and my daughter, Anya, who is, by the way, behind the, the scenes of this broadcast. She is also in the Netherlands. She's in Utrecht and she's helping with the technical side of the show. She's seeing your comments. She's posting them, posting them on the screen. So at that time, Anya uh, was still at school. She's now a student, but she was at school. And 
and we had the pleasure of visiting uh, James uh, in Amsterdam in the house of denim facility, right? And you showed us uh, what what uh, what you do uh, there and how you work to make the denim industry, which is the big industry in the Netherlands, uh, sustainable. Perhaps we can start from that, and then you can tell us a little bit more about uh, your other, uh, you know, companies, consulting companies. And please don't don't worry too much about the background noise. It's it's fine. Okay, <laughs> we all understand. Okay, good. It's actually adds, uh, you know, certain vibe to it. Okay. Like you you are okay. in, the, in in the Netherlands in the middle of the Hague, so it's it's cool. Yeah, it's a lively place. Okay, so yeah. Um... So yeah, uh, looking back on, our, on where we met was at the House of Denim uh, in Amsterdam, which is a which is a platform to to uh, like you said to connect and inspire the the leaders of the denim industry to uh, to join forces in taking denim to a more sustainable uh, state. So the global denim industry um, it's about a hundred billion euro uh, industry globally in terms of annual turnover. Um, Denim, obviously, traditionally a source of cool, of pride, youth, independence. Um, so many people have very fond memories of their first jeans. Little do they know that it's also a very polluting industry. It's totally linear. We're just basically making waste. So an initiative um, was started in 2010 to bring together at least the Amsterdam denim leadership community in thinking about how we could join forces to make the tough choices that you that you need to make as an industry to to reduce uh, the impact that we have to change fundamental aspects of the industry and so um we we wondered how to do this and in then in co-creation with experts from around the industry and around the world we set up this wonderful uh knowledge hub which is which basically looks like a little denim factory in the heart of amsterdam filled with wonderful young talents learning a trade learning a craft and uh, it's a great way to pull in both consumers, young people, but also industry leaders and share this discussion, uh, in inspiration, share hope, share ideas, share creative solutions on how to take the industry forward. I also understand in that you're running quite a do. bit of yeah, educational uh, events, right? Because there is the Gene yeah. School and the Denim exactly. City initiatives. Yeah, yeah. So... Um, Basically, the question we tried to answer was, how might we save this industry? If not, say the, try and save the planet, but how might we save the denim industry? And um, uh, one of the answers was that we need to train a new generation of young craftspeople who understand this new face of denim, this new, more collaboration-based, less impactful, more sustainable denim industry. And... Um, and so we started a gene school, the world's first school, vocational school, dedicated to sustainable denim. And we found also that having these young people learning this new trade uh, with their curiosity and their creativity was a great way to pull in existing industry leaders because they're obviously all excited to talk to young people. And that was even stronger than their reluctance to speak to their competitors. So in fact, starting with the school, starting with the future, with the youth, was our key to bring together industry leaders who face obviously with many tough decisions. I mean, everybody wants to be more sustainable, but it just comes down to making the painful business decisions that are required to, to move on that um, on that transition. So well, speaking uh, about, uh, yeah, you know, thank you, th thank you. Well, speaking about the requirement for sustainability versus uh, the inherent you know no need for it uh so can you maybe talk a little bit more about yeah at, at which point uh and whether it will stop being just a requirement and sort of uh uh just uh on the agenda of uh the cfos and uh become the true need for the business to to be sustainable to perhaps mm. also help its own development that's a, that's and, really, and yeah that's a really interesting question and i think the denim industry example that i'm you know i'm actively involved in is probably uh 
an example or a metaphor for many other sectors and industries that are, that are um, going through the same painful uh, process towards, you know, from where they were to where they should be going. And I think you're totally right. When when we started this project way back in 20, 2009, it was probably 2008, 2009, Amsterdam was at the pinnacle of its power as a denim capital. Business was booming. The brands were super strong internationally. Um, at that time, the sustainability agenda, topic, question, challenge was owned by NGOs like Greenpeace, right? So advocacy groups, NGOs, raising the urgency of change. Um, from there, it went into the corporate affairs teams or the sustainability uh, leadership teams, engineering teams, uh, into maybe supply chain decisions. Uh, then because it was uh, exposure in terms of uh, legal uh, requirements and legislation, it became the CFO's job. From the CFO, it went to the uh, the CMO and the head of people and the, now the CEO. And I think something similar can be said for the topic of sustainability or transition in any industry is that it started out as an outside angry mob saying you must change and it's now come through all those desks to basically be an all pervasive question which is not about legislation or shouldn't be about legislation but should be about this inherent desire for a company to be a part of its communities and a part of its ecosystems and fundamentally fundamentally embrace this new paradigm rather than shaving off a few you know bits of of product or margin uh, just to satisfy uh, a corporate affairs questions um, so yeah this this journey that i've been on personally um, you know, at the time in 2008, 2009, 2010, people would laugh at us when we talked about sustainability and the need for change and the need for collaboration in this space. Fast forward 10 to 12 years, 15 years later, and now it's a generally accepted uh, notion that, that there's no way that one industry or one, comp sorry, one company or one government can change a system we really must you know, join hands across the international value chains and see how and where we can make changes so that this mega industry with its inter interdependencies can, can change. Um, so then, you know, legislation is not the key topic we should be talking about. It, we really need new visionaries. We need fundamental principles. We need a level playing field based on trust and collaboration, not on legislation and, and control. Uh, so it's a very fundamental, it's a very fundamental uh, change. I can see there's a question in here. Do you uh, yes, think it that's... might be possible? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think it might be possible to get the denim industry on board with a degrowth vision? It's funny that you mentioned that because um, uh, degrowth obviously is the, is the, fundamental answer right making making the same amount of stuff in a less harmful way will only very marginally change the footprint of any industry so it's all about making basically making less stuff um the denim industry uh the visionaries are just like any intelligent person <laughs> uh we understand this uh just now at lunch I was speaking to uh, another person who's a board architect who's a visionary in the world of, um, of fibers and um, textile manufacturing. And uh, we actually had this exact same discussion. You know, the big question is make less stuff, uh, buy and throw away less stuff. Um, so whether or not the term degrowth is the one is, 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 a, is a broadly accepted term. I think it's the big challenge that all leadership teams are now facing. How might we really make this impact that we need, i.e. make less stuff or commit to a degrowth paradigm, and at the same time, satisfy all the other urgencies that are on our plate, such as sustainable employment for all of our people, uh, margin pressures from, from our colleagues, uh, even shareholders, um, uh, from from a from a micro perspective, us personally, you know, like 
uh, you know, I want my budget, I want my um, my bonus because my wife wants to go on a fancy holiday or whatever, right through to more uh, global ethical concerns of saying, okay, what will my legacy be as a as a leader? You know, uh, being entrusted with a position of power and influence. You know, if we look if we look towards the future and then look back on on who we are and how we're acting. You know, am I am I doing all I can to contribute to this paradigm shift? So I don't know. The denim industry, as a whole, uh, like any other industry, is full with a filled with a diversity of perspectives. But um, I think that uh, the degrowth as a as a as the key topic now in sustainability has been accepted as as the question to answer. Whereas beforehand, it was uh, use less chemicals. Or have no discharge of harmful chemicals or reuse of fibers i think that the degrowth now is the big ugly beast that that needs to be carved by by all leaders at this at this moment in time is there an understanding in the in the leadership board or perhaps the the board of directors uh about this or it's a sensitive topic yeah, yeah it's a sensitive topic because at a personal level, obviously, when when um, when the future is discussed among, for example, my advisory board, or when uh, so twice annually we invite all the denim industry leaders for breakfast, uh, so we have an opportunity to to mingle informally and discuss, sort of under Chatham House rules. Obviously, these questions are now starting to be discussed, but I wouldn't say that it, there's. It's going to be easy to create a consensus among business leaders, some of them who are, you know, publicly listed, um, uh, that we should all share in, you know, reducing the total volume of of, of genes manufactured because um, it's an era of transitions. Yeah, I mean, we're still in the old paradigm and also moving towards a new paradigm. It's it's uh, it's painful, and uh, what we're seeing now are some signs of this new paradigm of reality manifesting itself, i.e. many, many people are already buying less garments. You know, it's not it's not just uh, talk. Uh, many brands in the world are facing reductions in turnover for the for the first time in uh, their memories. So, uh, yeah, this could be uh, a sort of a first signal of people wanting actually less less stuff less you know obviously most industries have a pyramid you know with with lower price goods in very very much significantly higher volumes uh to be totally honest from a personal perspective i'm hoping for a perspective uh, of paradigm of less less cheap shit you know less 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 rubbish that we that we buy online we get delivered home for free we wear twice and then we we throw it out and it ends up somewhere else in the world in a, in a, in a, in a ghastly place. That is a paradigm that must stop. Um, the tough bit is obviously that you can't speak for others who have the freedom to buy whatever they like. You know, if people, if people really want to buy cheap garments, wear them once and throw them out or think that they look fat in it and don't want to wear it at all and then throw it out. I mean, that's, that's not something that the industry can change per se. Um, uh, so yeah, the, the, everybody now in, and probably everybody, every industry is on the lookout for these new business models that might provide margin or might provide solutions or might provide ongoing business, uh, any other paradigm than making more stuff every season and trying to make it look exciting. It's a tough one. Right, and of course, a lot here uh, has to will have to do with uh, educating people <laughs> on consuming less. But of course, just like you said, it's a painful task, and of course, not everybody is going to be uh, on board with that. People just still live in the in the old world where this was not, I guess, that important. And now, of course, it's becoming more and more important uh, every year as we are pushing the, the planetary boundaries and limits. Yeah, yeah and, and, and it's it, like you say, you know, it's about education, but it's also about, <clears throat> it's also about culture. 
You know, I think it's fair to say that we live in an era where where wealth and opulence are still idealized by many. And I can imagine that, especially if you're if you're coming from a lesser developed, less prosperous uh, context, culture or background, I can imagine it's, you know, you dream of being more wealthy, having possessing more worldly goods, looking like the people that you see on Instagram or on television or in the movies. So it's very hard to then turn around from a totally privileged part of the world and say, yeah, wanting, you know, aspiring to have stuff is bad for the planet. <laughs> you know, that's just, that's just not the way it works. So I can imagine that many people aspire to have things. And yet as a, as a, as a, as a species, as humanity, we really need to move into a different space than, you know, promoting the acquisition of, of physical goods, you know? So it's a it's a it's a really really fundamental almost spiritual issue, as well as an industry change one, as well as a economical one or a sociological one. Or, um, yeah, it's it's interesting when when I look at the students at the Gene School who are typically between eighteen and twenty years old. Um, for many of them, it's the first time that they've actually learned to be really good at making anything themselves right so they learn to sew and cut design cut and sew uh, jeans uh quite a few of them are now making making their living producing garments for others so for their friends for people that they that find them online etc and the way that they purchase garments is just totally different from the way that we would do uh so when i was young so let's say 25 25 years ago um so yeah change is happening and it's it's an evolution and uh i think you're right education will play a big part in this but education in the sense of what influential people say the messages that we have about you know life in general not just about technical aspects of manufacturing we're getting into a really heavy topic straight away. Uh, <laughs> oh, that is, but, it's, uh, yeah. uh, you know, fascinating. It's really interesting. We actually had a question comment uh, from Ron uh, Finch, and uh, he's uh, in Italy. Thanks, Ron, mm. again for uh, for being here with us today. Uh, yeah, Ron's been well. Can you see James? I don't want to read the whole thing, yeah, but I can see it. basically yeah. has to do with uh, changing yeah. how the denim is yeah, made and so whether it's something the clothing is made and whether it's something that you have seen in the denim industry. Yeah. So basically if I understand the, the question correctly, so what we see is people reducing the actual intrinsic quality of a garment to maintain margins or increase margins, right. Or to, to <clears throat> create a cushion to, to be able to absorb cost. Um, uh, in the denim industry, generally speaking, garments are made with specific fabric requirements. So there's not a lot of change in actual intrinsic quality of garments. What, what I think um, uh, the, the main question is, is that over the past decades, garments in general have become of a, a, a far lesser intrinsic quality in terms of how they are made, how, how, how long you might be able to wear them, right? So longevity. Um, and um, this is, this is uh, bad at many levels uh, because if we say, you know, reduce and uh, reuse and repair, you know, garments that have been made at a lower quality obviously have less potential to be repaired and, and loved for longer. So in that sense, possibly the denim industry could could be an example even because if you buy a good pair of jeans, obviously they will wear with you. Um, they will adopt part of your character. They will be, become more meaningful to you. And the more that the jean is worn, uh, contrary to any other garment, the, the value of it rises because of its aging. So maybe there's some inspiration to be found, um, to be found uh, in the denim industry after all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so Let's much. Uh, yeah, Ron is uh, continuing uh, with uh, his comments. So uh, whether he's asking about the, whether the, the customer pressures uh, 
help drive the sustainability of the denim industry. I think mm -hmm. you already talked about this at least a little bit that uh, especially younger generation are more uh, conscious now of, I guess, uh, how much they want to buy. And that probably applies, well, of course, applies to denim industry as well. Or they it's an interesting the 1% for the yeah, planet, so, does it really help? So 1% so for the planet is a great initiative, uh, although it, it doesn't really stimulate. So it's a great way for, for brands to show that they care and, and uh, use their revenues to sponsor uh, environmental, or sustainable or social projects, right? Uh, great, uh, great initiative. Um, I think, I think that the, the interesting uh, impact that young consumers are having now is that more and more boardrooms are, are being presented with research about young adults. Uh, and their motivations and their aspirations. And more and more senior leadership teams are realizing that young people want something different from them in terms of the, the message that they convey, in terms of the products and the services that they provide, uh, the, the experiences. Um, I think if I, if I remember correctly, um, a recent publication from Unilever mentioned that uh, seventy percent of their margin growth comes from purpose-driven brands in the portfolio, right? So, like Ben and Jerry's or One Earth. Seventy percent of margin growth coming from a category of brands that have a single activist, almost brand message. That is all. Uh, that is again a sign that consumer demands are changing. And it's a great stimulus for more and more brands, for example, to become a B Corp, which in turn, like a registered B Corporation, certified B Corporation, I'll just assume that people in this group know what I'm talking about. The great thing is that if you become a B Corporation, basically to satisfy the, the wishes and aspirations of your customers, the system then forces you on all these uh, dimensions of sustainability to do a better job year on year on year on year. So to reduce your packaging impact, reduce your footprint, uh, uh, drive diversity and inclusion, become a better employer, be more transparent, all of these, all of these great things that we need uh, for, for the transition. So 1% for the planet. <clears throat> uh, I haven't seen a lot of impact from that specific campaign recently. But I think it's fair to say that the big, the big engine behind sustainability and the transition to a different paradigm was sort of visionary leaders supported by fierce consumer advocacy groups or, or NGOs, and is now coming from more the business engine of things, basically consumer demand predictions, telling boardrooms to raise their raise the bar and you know change the game on how they're how they're doing, how they're doing their business. So not just specific for the denim industry. This is in, this is across the board in any industry. I think that's what's going on right now, which is, which right. is hopeful, right? Which is good. Right. Very <laughs> hopeful. And yeah, I was going to ask you about another example uh, of this kind of work, but yeah, let's maybe answer Anya's question, uh, going back to, to the growth uh, uh, solution. Uh, for the denim yeah. fashion industry as second hand as a second hand consumption yeah so second hand or vintage or uh, renting garments rather than buying them or uh, all so all of the main players in the textile and fashion industry are all exploring these business models this the 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 painful truth is that none of these models really have the potential to replace the business and margin volume of the old model, right? And that's probably because the old model has been perfected basically since the Industrial Revolution, um, reduced the cost of manufacturing garments. And these global value chains have become exceptionally efficient in producing garments to at really low costs, which allow brands who have got strong brand power to make huge margins. And um, the truth is that that era is simply ending. <laughs> uh, but when it finally does, we don't know. 
And so basically the strategy of most fashion brands is to just stay in the game and make as much money as they can for as long as they can, which is what companies were, were designed to do in the in, in, in previous eras, right? So yeah, I don't really see, to answer your question quickly, sorry, uh, I don't really see vintage or secondhand uh, as one of the big solutions. Not uh, not me, no, no. All right, although it's one of the I answers. have to say, we'll need, all of I it. Have... we'll need all of the answers. We'll need all of the solutions, all of the potential solutions we'll need. Um, yeah, maybe it's too, too detailed to go into further detail on that one. Right? Perhaps this is one way of also uh, changing the culture because when there is this uh, second garment market available, then it's sort of, especially for the younger people, that's that teaches them something. And that's if it becomes quite even fashionable to perhaps buy your clothes, not necessarily you know, like as new, but go in this vintage stores. Uh, then it's again, it's it's a, it's a process of changing uh, the views and uh, yeah. uh, changing the culture, as you correctly said before. Yeah. And I have to say that well, in Europe, this is much more developed. I mean, I know I uh, <laughs> in even in in the in Holland in in the Netherlands, you can find uh, quite fancy uh, you know vintage stores. You can find excellent clothes mm -hmm. there, and for for very good price, and especially for younger people, that's very appealing. Uh, here in the United cool. States, where I am now, unfortunately, that culture is almost non-existent, although there are places like Goodwill and some other stores where you can buy things very cheaply that's been used. And mm. some people do that, but I just say here it just has a different, you know, flavor. Mm. Maybe it's not as fashionable. Yeah. It's more like just out of, you know, need that you, you just don't yeah. have enough money to buy the, the new stuff. Exactly. And that's it's a out different of poverty or mentality. Charity. Yeah. Well, I think so. it's safe to say that fashion is about aspiration, right? About what you aspire to be, the way you aspire to look, right? Um, this is the way that we've been programmed by advertising, at least in the past centuries. Um, I think uh, an interesting trend, you're right, you know, in Amsterdam for young people, it's way cooler to find cool stuff in a secondhand or vintage store and to curate your own look from that and to, you know, uh, it's aspirational, cool people are doing this, cool influencers saying, look at what I've, you know, this outfit today, nothing is new, you know. It's, so it's become cool, as Anya was mentioning, for young people to, to not buy new stuff from a, from a big chain store. Um, and yet, uh, that means that the big brands are just making less money. So obviously they'll move into these new business models, but um, they'll still be hoping that people buy new stuff because that's how they make more money. Right. Yeah. So partial solution. Right. Well, uh, if we want to leave the, the clothing denim industry for a while and perhaps go to some other industries, I know you have huge experience working with uh, all sorts of uh, companies and manufacturers. And I just wanted previously when we were preparing for this for today, we, we you talked about the Heineken campaign, of mm. course, Heineken. Uh, the, the Dutch beer and uh, this brew a better world campaign. And I just, I mean, I, yeah. I find it fascinating, but there are also, uh, of course, a lot of questions around it. And I just wanted to, uh, you to talk a little bit more about it. And uh, I actually, have you been involved in, 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 in this or is it just an example that you can uh, no. give us from yeah, so the Netherlands? This yeah, so this is uh, probably one of the most uh, prestigious projects I've been involved in career-wise, in terms of sustainability, at least. Um, this is this is the global, the Heineken Global Sustainable Development Strategy. Uh, um, it's called Brew a Better World, and on the image that you just showed, um, the the the. Uh, the circle represents the footprint of a beer bottle, right? So there's a symbolism there, the footprint, get it? The footprint of a beer bottle. Um, and uh, this is a, so the Heineken company is one of the biggest uh, in the Netherlands. And um, they have a really strong and long standing tradition of sustainable innovations. And also they were one of the first 
companies in the Netherlands to um, to produce an annual sustainability report and to present their sustainability uh, impact mm -hmm. progress alongside financial report. So they they had a long track record, um, but the uh, the Heineken team wanted to create uh, basically what I just discussed, right? The transition from the corporate affairs team to the CFO, to the CMO, to the CEO, to the head of people. What, what Heineken wanted was to have a sustainability structure that was much closer to all of their, what is it, 20,000 employees around the world or even, even more. And many companies tend to have a sustainability report which is written by sustainability people and then read by sustainability people and doesn't really impact the work or lives of anyone else substantially because it's just so remote from their day-to-day -day concerns or day-to-day -day jobs. And so the mission that we were on was to answer this question, you know, how can we make the sustainable development goals of the Heineken company a part of everybody's lives and work? And to do so, we needed to create meaning, to reduce complexity, and to, to make it far more close to every day's, everyone's identity of being a Heineken employee. And, um, and so uh, the great thing about this Brew About a World campaign is that it has greatly simplified the topic of sustainability. You know, what does it mean to me? So in fact, the campaign... Um, is uh, really great because the sustainability strategy is placed on one beer coast, right? One beer mat, right? And so I'm not sure if everybody's uh, aware of this custom, but at least in the Netherlands, when you when you pour a draft beer, you you post uh, the, you put the glass on a, a cardboard coaster so that you don't get sticky tables, right? And so what we did was we took this 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 piece of culture which is very close to to many people's um, beer experience, and we fit the entire sustainability strategy on one coaster. So there's one strategy, which is called Brew About a World, Brew About a World and then the 2030 edition is called Raise the Bar. And then there's three pillars, which is uh, planet, uh, people, and responsibility. And then under planet, it's uh, water to waste and emissions. And then under those, there's uh, two commitments. So it's a really simple structure that everybody can understand and it fits on something which is right you know you can't get closer to a beer than a beer mat right than a coaster so symbolically and operationally we've managed to bring this topic of sustainability which is generally you know a complex topic which is about responsible and compliance and problems it's probably the diametrical opposite of a beer, right? When you're having a beer, you want to talk to friends, you want to get merry, you want to have a fun time. You don't want to think about all the concerns of the world. And yet what we've done is repackaged all of those concerns into ambitions and fit them right, right near the actual beer. Um, and the great thing is, um, so we were, we were um, part of the team, supporting the team that developed this. The, uh, the, uh, I actually personally remember the idea of the beer mat coming up and the footprint coming up. And the great thing is that uh, together with our Heineken team members, we managed to get this right up to the board. Dolphin Brink, the CEO, loved it, embraced it, uh, rolled it out across the world. And um, in that sense, I think it's uh, an example. It's a great example of how... Uh, we should bring this complicated topic of sustainability directly into the realm of all of our lives rather than just, you know, throw it over to the sustainability team or the corporate affairs team to deal with it, right? Because these are really challenging topics that we all need to address and we can only do so when we see that progress and uh, profit, you know, no margin, no mission, how those go hand in hand, you know. So, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I was actually quite proud of being part of that part of that project. Oh, this is very impressive, uh, of course, and uh, this this brings us also to the topic of uh, discussing the consultant's role in uh, the mm. directing businesses towards more sustainable practices. And uh, for consultants being that catalyst of, uh, of change,
but of course uh, there, there can also be issues here because uh, there could be a sort of ethical you know dilemmas if for example uh, the consultants views and uh, the way that they want the business to go doesn't necessarily fit with uh, the, the type of the business that that they work with or the the plans that the business has in terms of its uh, profits and its its growth. So how can consultants, you know, deal with this ethical dilemma? And how, maybe you can have uh, you you have some examples in your own practice mm, definitely definitely yeah so um there's a number of there's a number of topics that relate to your question um i think first of all this has to do with actually the role of the consultant in its core you know so um Many consultants are just smart people for hire, you know. They'll traditionally, they'll say, uh, a leadership team will say, hey, we want you to prove that this is a great decision. And then you'll be very clever and do all kinds of calculations and then you'll prove that it's a great decision, right? That's, that's one of the typical stereotypes of what uh, strategy consultants sometimes do. Um, I think that in this era and the era ahead, um, we need to have a different role. Um, I think that morality plays a, a bigger and bigger role uh, in our work than it used to. Um, so for example, my company who are B Corp certified, and as you said, uh, is a mission first company. We uh, differ from a number of other competitive consultants in the sense that we are more uh, co-initiators of things so that we, you know, we're not we're not just passive advisors, but we actually collaborate with other parties in the market to realize new platforms or to you know to bring initiatives forward. Um, but uh, yeah, so in in my team, there's a there's a there's an active discussion about ethics, right? Uh, it's about uh, who do we want to work for, uh, who do we get to ask our team to put their talents to use for um do we want to do we want to spend our time helping people sell more sugary soft drinks we don't know you know tobacco is easy to rule out um uh, guns and bombs used to be easy to rule out before obviously uh, the, the wars all around the world um uh so we get for example an active discussion on do we want to work for shell you know I'm quite close to the former headquarters of, of Shell here. Um, would we work for one of the biggest oil companies in the world? On the one hand, you can say, you know, without Shell and those companies, there will be no energy transition. Um, on the other hand, uh, you could say we don't want to, we don't want to contribute to selling more oil. You know, um, just as in any ethical discussion, there's always. There's always opposing schools of thought. Um, on the one hand, like in traditional ethics, you can have the principle-driven type of ethics, or you can have the consequence-driven part of ethics. Uh, for me, for me personally, um, I'm happy that we've taken this decision quite a long time ago. That we are we we actively think about the assignments that we want to do, and we go out and look for those. Um, and and still, also for us, you know, there's, there's there's this question of, you know, is it ethical to to fly out to Mongolia and work with the Heineken Mongolia team on developing a sustainability strategy? You know, is that sustainable? Uh, in the end, I think it boils down to individual points of view and ethics. Um, uh, yeah, so it's it's a there's there's no there's no definitive answer to many of these ethical dilemmas um, but um, what one of the personal observations I have is that also within leadership teams of companies many people are 
trying to figure out this same question you know what should we do what can be asked of me when is the time that we make these painful decisions how might we help our industry make a transition um uh, how do we explain that if you're talking about people and planet and progress in a sustainability strategy that you don't have the p of profit in there or how do you have profit and people and planetary impact at equal equal levels in your decision making it's um it's not as easy as we see and in this era so for example if you take uh, the very visible paul Pullman at unilever obviously he made very bold moves for unilever to transition to a more sustainable company uh in the end i think he was uh, thwarted by his shareholders um and and uh, a more profit-driven leader was brought in um so yeah i think the pendulum swings back and forth now and then and uh that that's just the symbol of this era you know we're, we're trying to find new ways forward which have both profit potential and progress uh you know because no margin no mission right if you don't if a company doesn't make uh money then you can't employ anyone and you cease to be um so yeah sorry i'm just going on on this thought but it's a very it, it's a it's a it's a challenging issue to solve and yeah that's why we're there so we also speak about these kind of things to our uh, to our clients and try to encourage them to be bold and to to go out there and to really uh you know have the impact that they uh that they aspire to Right. No, this is all, uh, of course, very interesting, and it is uh, quite a dilemma, a lot to think about. Uh, of course, your personal views on things also play a role. I just wanted, uh, I saw some comments coming from Ron again. Mm -hmm. uh, I know Ron also, uh, well, he's a sustainability specialist, engineer specifically. So maybe we can see those comments. So he was commenting on the the you know the Heineken campaign that he will be on the the lookout for for those uh, um, you know beer mats. And Ron, being from mm. Canada, he says it's common to see those environmental initiatives among uh, microbrewers. Uh, but uh, have you have you heard about other big uh, brewers, big com big beer companies doing something similar to what Heineken has been doing? That's a really interesting question. So uh, due to the nature of our work, I only work for one one big brewery. So I don't also work for ABM Bev, for example. But what I know is that, you know, whenever you're preparing a strategy uh, project, you always do some desk research and go for best practices, etc. cetera. Um, recently, I saw some research on sustainability strategies in general, and then you had the the Diageo one, and then you had the uh, Danone one, and then the Coke one, and then the Heineken one were presented side by side. Um, so I'm pretty sure that other boardrooms have seen what Heineken's doing. Um, I've not seen any any bold moves from the big breweries. But for example, what you do see, and that's something which is quite inspiring to me, is for example, brands like Corona, who are all about being at the beach, being, you know, a, on a holiday far away from from the stress of the city um picking up this responsibility uh by uh, by um offering uh waste collection points and and doing this under the message of um, keep paradise clean you know so uh it's interesting from the point of view that beer which is a, a fun escapist uh lifestyle category embracing this aspect of responsibility and uh, it's great to hear that you know microbreweries are doing this obviously microbreweries very dependent on the communities that they come from and that they serve it would be great to see more enterprise embrace stuff contribute to stuff initiate stuff like well microbreweries and other brands uh, you know really take the lead and enable, inspire and enable people to, to change their behavior yeah, there's there's many really inspiring examples out there that we that we can really learn from and that could be applied to any industry if we're just you know if we want to and if we find the creativity to find ways to do so 
Okay, well, great. Thank you. Uh, we, I saw another uh, comment and actually a greeting from Moldova from Ivan. Wow. Uh, yeah, thank you so Moldova. much, uh, Ivan, for being here with us today. And he had a question. Uh, does a company have a finite number of innovations that could be implemented and absorbed in a limited time period? How it could be calculated? What do you think? Wow. So, Ivan, <laughs> thanks for this, this question. Uh, I'm guessing you're, you're an engineer or a mathematician. Um, so I'm an anthropologist by training, so I'm, I don't really feel intelligent enough to answer this question. But it's fair to say that, um, in general, um, nowadays, when we're trying to answer these complicated questions, we should make resources available to try a great number of innovations. So many, many ideas need to be conceived, developed, and, 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 and piloted. But at the same time, obviously, most companies make money by doing a few simple things very well. And so if you dial up complexity and you dial up diversity, then obviously you're going to dial down profitability, operational excellence. Uh, you're going to dial up the opportunity for failure, for error, for risk. Um, so I'm, I don't think there's a finite number, but there obviously is a trade-off between change and consistency, um, which is probably why most companies work with a, some kind of an innovation model, which allows for both large numbers of ideas, but then funnels down, you know, like for example, using the stage gate model, uh, starting with a hundred ideas, chopping them down to the 25 best ones, you know, like business modeling 10 of them, piloting five, and applying three. Um, that's that's what I see around me now, but I'd be interested to hear if anyone's got a better way of doing it. But there's there's, there's probably like this um, uh, golden measure of how much change versus how much consistency is needed in a certain system. Um, Maybe I have to look back into Schumpeter's change theory or that kind of stuff, but um, I don't know. Is the is the honest answer? Great, great question though, Yvonne. Well, something to, to think about. <laughs> mm. Definitely. Mm. Well, thank you, yeah, Ivan, mm. for this great question. Thank you for being with us today. Well, we're kind of near uh, nearing the end of the hour, and we still have uh, wow, well, already to to discuss because uh, uh, I wanted to to say that uh, James actually is a, was a co-author of a book on uh, collaboration mm. and, uh, and we can we can show the how the book looks uh, and uh, it's I know it's a big topic in itself uh, collaboration coalitions and uh, how all this can be used in order for companies to become uh, more impactful and uh, how this can add value. We don't have a lot of time, but perhaps you can talk a little bit uh, more about coalitions and how it is important to to have them in in our times. Ivan is saying, Definitely. yes, you're right. Uh, yeah, I, I am an I'm engineer. An engineer. So <laughs> <laughs> you guessed right. <laughs> so I, 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 I found him out on that one. Okay, so just about, uh, just about the, the book. So what we found is that in most companies that we work with, the ch change is driven by change makers, right? People who have this urge, who have this drive, who have this inspiration, who have this desire to use their job as an opportunity to create the change that they're, that they're dreaming of, right? And many people are frustrated uh, or they think that they're, you know, they want to change, but they don't know how. And that's why we wrote this this book. It's very easy to read, um, in which we shared the learnings that we have on how to collaborate. Because we find that to change, you need to bring perspectives together. We need to embrace diversity. We need to collaborate between steps in the value chain and no single company can do anything on their own you'll probably to change you'll need government you'll need your customers or your suppliers or all of those um, 
And anyway, so that's what the book is about. It's about how co-creation works, uh, five simple guiding principles, uh, a whole chapter on how to, <laughs> and it's great to get feedback from people who have read the book and have, have, have started their own projects uh, to hear from them that it works. Um, and uh, so, yeah, co-creation as a term, uh, it's been around for a while, but many people don't really didn't really know what it meant. So that's also another reason for writing this book. And, um, and moving from that into the topic of coalitions, which is, uh, yeah, symbolized by why I'm here today, I think that more and more we're seeing that we need to collaborate between governments and, and industry, you know, private sector uh, partners, um, governments maybe to set regulations, create level playing field, entrepreneurs to take the lead, to take risks, to innovate. So each to do what they're best at, and so to stand on each other's shoulders and to to, to reach further. Um, so to to co-develop legislation, etc., etc., etc. Oh wow! So here's another PhD question: How do you collect data? <laughs> uh, to analyze Michael, the yeah, welcome. Uh, wow. <laughs> yeah, thank you for for the Hi, question. Michael. So to answer that one, I don't. Uh, often collect data. Um, so uh, whew, the the carbon uh, uh, emissions thing, uh, maybe that's for a different that's for a different chat. I'd uh, I'd I'd need I'd need to know more about what what your specific question is. I'm very sorry. I'm not an expert on uh, scope three emissions. Um, I'm very sorry. No, that's okay. That's okay. Yeah, there's. Uh plenty of more episodes coming up so we will see what is of interest we can certainly address those topics uh in the future yeah. but uh it's a yeah, really interesting back... one from the point of view that that the scope three obviously so scope three is where you where you take on board emissions from other parts of the value chain that, that you are responsible for um yeah, this is this is a really this is a really tough one. It depends on the industry. It depends on how complex the supply chain is. Um, yeah, maybe for another time. <laughs> right. Yeah, if, we if that's already, okay with you, Victoria. Uh, we already reached our uh, hour, so I just wanted to mention again that the book that uh, James co-authored, uh, "Collaborate or, or Die." Uh, it's, uh, we will be posting a link to it uh, in the comments of our various Thanks. platforms where we are uh, broadcasting now. So you can always go to that uh, through that link to the landing page for the book and uh, you, can, you can purchase it if, if you're interested. So that, that would be wonderful. Reach out to us uh, if you have a question. Yes. Uh, also, yeah, the contacts are there on the websites that, and Anya already posted the links to your uh, company Elemental and the House of Denim Foundation. So it's all there. So if, if people, our viewers have more questions, they can reach out to you uh, directly through those contacts. But we are uh, nearing the end of the hour, and I know, James, that you have things to do. You still have your visit to the Ministry of, of Social Affairs <laughs> there in The Hague. That's and again, right. Thank you yep. so much uh, for, for, you know, finding this time uh, in, in the, on this busy day uh, in The Hague for you. So wishing you good luck with your visits there. So hope everything goes smoothly and uh, the the coalition with the government uh, actually gets you know stronger. Whatever tasks you have on on the agenda with them, so I really appreciate you being here with us, and uh, we'll be looking uh, forward to perhaps other ways to uh, bring you on and ask you questions because you have such a great experience uh, as a consultant, oh. as someone uh, in the, working in the sustainability and uh, impact area. Thank, thanks for Thank your, you. all your flattering uh, words, Victoria. And uh, it really is a great pleasure to, to reach out to uh, like-minded professionals around the world who are facing the same challenges. Uh, so thank you very much for, uh, for your interest. It's been a huge, you know, it's very flattering for, to see people from all around the world joining the feed and, and being interested in uh, what we have to say. Uh, if there's anything that we can contribute to, or if you have any questions, you know, I, I'd love to 
to further the conversation with any of your with any of your friends. And uh, thank you very much for uh, providing the opportunity to, to share some ideas today, Victoria. It's been lovely. Thank you, James. Well, before we go, just uh, one little announcement again. Please, uh, please check the foundation's website for the uh, information about our award for excellence in consulting. And this is for the professional consultants out there. If you haven't, you know, learned about it yet, if you didn't know that we are accepting applications this year. Uh, you have a few days until next Monday to prepare your submission and to send it our way. And again, thank you to our wonderful speakers today, to James, thank you to Anya Al Salim for diligently managing the backstage of this show. Thank you to all of our amazing viewers who joined around from around the globe. Thank you for your comments and questions. Uh, please stay tuned for our next episode, which will be coming on December 1st, on the next 1st. <laughs> and uh, actually, at that time, we will bring back uh, Dwight Mihalic uh, uh, with the conversation, continued conversation on artificial intelligence. Uh, that area, that field develops very fast. We already talked to Dwight uh, a few months ago, but of course there is a lot more that he would like to share. So please stay tuned. Um, and uh, on December 1st at the same time, uh, we'll be here with Dwight talking about AI. Thank you to all of you. Have a good day, have a good evening, wherever you are. And uh, this is it for today. Take care and goodbye. Thanks everyone.